This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read and recorded by Betsy Bush. Marquette, Michigan, February 2006. Fishing with a Worm by Bliss Perry. The last fish I caught was with a worm. Isaac Walton. A defective logic is the born fisherman's portion. He is a pattern of inconsistency. He does the things which he ought not to do, and he leaves undone the things which other people think he ought to do. He observes the wind when he should be sowing, and he regards the clouds with temptation tugging familiarity at his heartstrings when he might be grasping the useful sickle. It is a wonder that there is so much health in him. A sorrowing political economist remarked to me in early boyhood, as a jolly red-bearded neighbor, followed by an abnormally fat dog, sauntered past us for his nooning, that man is the best carpenter in town, but he will leave the most important job whenever he wants to go fishing. I stared at the sinful carpenter, who swung along leisurely in the May sunshine, keeping just ahead of his dog, to leave one's job in order to go fishing. How illogical! Years bring the reconciling mind. The world grows big enough to include within its scheme both the instructive political economist and the truant mechanic. But that trick of truly logical behavior seems harder to the man than to the child. For example, I climbed up to my den under the eaves last night, a sour black sea fog lying all about, and the December sleet crackling against the window panes, in order to varnish a certain fly rod. Now, rods ought to be put in order in September, when the fishing closes, or else in April, when it opens. To varnish a rod in December proves that one possesses either a dilatory or a childishly anticipatory mind. But before uncorking the varnish bottle, it occurred to me to examine a dog-eared, water-stained fly-book to guard against the ravages of possible moths. This interlude proved fatal to the varnishing. A half-hour went happily by in rearranging the flies. Then, with a fisherman's lack of sequence, as I picked out here and there a plain snell-hook from the gaudy feathered ones, I said to myself with a generous glow at the heart, Fly-fishing has had enough sacred poets celebrating it already. Isn't there a good deal to be said, after all, for fishing with a worm? Could there be a more illogical proceeding? And here follows the treatise, a defense of results, an apology for opportunism, conceived in agreeable procrastination, devoted to the praise of the inconsequential angle worm, and dedicated to a childish memory of a whistling carpenter and his fat dog. Let us face the worst at the very beginning. It shall be a shameless example of fishing under conditions that make the fly a mockery. Take the Taylor Brook between the roads on the headwaters of the Lamoille. The place is a jungle. The swamp maples and cedars were felled a generation ago, and the tops were trimmed into the brook. The alders and moosewood are higher than your head. On every tiny knoll, the fir balsams have gained a footing, and creep down impenetrable to the edge of the water. In the open spaces, the joe pie weed swarms. In two minutes, after leaving the upper road, you have scared a mink or a rabbit, and you have probably lost the brook. Listen, it is only a gurgle here, droning along, smooth and dark, under the tangle of cedar tops and the shadow of the balsams. Follow the sound cautiously. There, beyond the joe pie weed, and between the stump and the cedar top, is a hand's breadth of black water. Fly casting is impossible in this maze of dead and living branches. Shorten your line to two feet, or even less. Bait your hook with a worm, and drop it gingerly into the gurgling crevice of water. Before it has sunk six inches, if there is not one of those black-backed, orange-bellied Taylor brook trout fighting with it, something is wrong with your worm, or with you. For the trout are always there, sheltered by the brushwood, that makes this half-mile of fishing not worth while. Below the lower road, the Taylor Brook becomes uncertain water. For half a mile, it yields only fingerlings, for no explainable reason. 
Then there are two miles of clean fishing through the deep woods, where the branches are so high that you can cast a fly again if you like, and there are long pools where now and then a heavy fish will rise. Then comes a final half mile through the alders where you must wade knee to waist deep before you come to the bridge and the river. Glorious fishing is sometimes to be had here, especially if you work down the gorge at twilight, casting a white miller until it is too dark to see. But alas, there is a well-worn path along the brook, and often enough there are the very footprints of the fellow ahead of you, signs as disheartening to the fishermen as ever were the footprints on the sand to Robinson Crusoe. But between the roads it is too much trouble to fish, and there lies the salvation of the humble fisherman, who disdains not to use the crawling worm, nor, for that matter, to crawl himself, if need be, in order to sneak under the boughs of some overhanging cedar that casts a perpetual shadow upon the sleepy brook. Lying here at full length, with no elbow room to manage the rod, you must occasionally even unjoint your tip, and fish with that, using but a dozen inches of line, and not letting so much as your eyebrows show above the bank. Is it a becoming attitude for a middle-aged citizen of the world? That depends on how the fish are biting. Holding a putt looks rather ridiculous also to the mere observer, but it requires, like brook fishing with a tip only, a very delicate wrist, perfect tactile sense, and a fine disregard of appearances. There are some fishermen who always fish as if they were being photographed. The Taylor Brook, between the roads, is not for them. To fish it at all is back-breaking, trouser-tearing work. To see it thoroughly fished is to learn new lessons in the art of angling. To watch R, for example, steadily filling his six-pound creel from that unlikely stream is like watching Sargent paint a portrait. R weighs two hundred and ten. Twenty years ago he was a famous amateur pitcher, and among his present avocations are violin playing, which is good for the wrist, taxidermy, which is good for the eye, and shooting woodcock, which before the days of the new nature study used to be thought good for the whole man. R began as a fly fisherman, but by dint of passing his summers near brooks where fly fishing is impossible, he has become a stout-hearted apologist for the worm. His apparatus is most singular. It consists of a very long, cheap rod, stout enough to smash through bushes, and with the stiffest tip obtainable. The lower end of the butt, below the reel, fits into the socket of a huge extra butt of bamboo, which R carries unconcernedly. To reach a distant hole, or to fish the lower end of a ripple, R simply locks his reel, slips on the extra butt, and there is a fourteen-foot rod ready for action. He fishes with a line unbelievably short, and a kendall hook far too big, and when a trout jumps for that hook, R wastes no time in maneuvering for position. The unlucky fish is simply derricked, to borrow a word from Theodore, most saturnine and profane of moosehead guides. "'Shall I play him a while?' shouted an excited sportsman to Theodore, after hooking his first big trout. No, growled Theodore in disgust, just derrick him right into the canoe. A heroic method, surely, though it once cost me the best square tail I ever hooked, for Theodore had forgotten the landing net, and the gut broke in his fingers as he tried to swing the fish aboard. But with these lively quarter-pounders of the Taylor Brook, derricking is a safer procedure. Indeed, I have sat dejectedly on the far end of a log after fishing the hole under it in vain, and seen the mighty R wade downstream close behind me, adjust that comical extra butt, and jerk a couple of half-pound trout from under the very log on which I was sitting. His device on this occasion, as I well remember, was to pass his hook just once through the middle of a big worm, let the worm sink to the bottom, and crawl along it at his leisure. The trout could not resist. Once, and once only, have I come near equaling R's record, and the way he beat me then is the justification for a whole philosophy of worm fishing. We were on this very Taylor Brook, and at five in the afternoon both baskets were two-thirds full. By count, I had just one more fish than he. It was raining hard. 
"'You fish down through the alders,' said R. magnanimously. "'I'll cut across and wait for you at the sawmill. "'I don't want to get any wetter on account of my rheumatism.' "'This was rather barefaced kindness, "'for whose rheumatism was ever the worse for another hour's fishing? "'But I weakly accepted it. "'I coveted three or four good trout to top off with. "'That was all. "'So I tied on a couple of flies and began to fish the alders.' wading waist-deep in the rapidly rising water, down the long green tunnel under the curving boughs. The brook fairly smoked with the rain by this time, but when did one fail to get at least three or four trout out of this best half-mile of the lower brook? Yet I had no luck. I tried one fly after another, and then, as a forlorn hope, though it sometimes was a magic of its own, I combined a brown heckle for the tail-fly with a twisting worm on the dropper. Not a rise. I thought of R. sitting patiently in the sawmill, and I finished more conscientiously than ever. Venture as warily, use the same skill. Do your best, whether winning or losing it, if you choose to play, is my principle. Even those lines which by some subtle telepathy of the trout brook murmur themselves over and over in me in the waning hours of an unlucky day brought now no consolation. There was simply not one fish to be had to any fly in the book out of that long, drenching, darkening tunnel. At last I climbed out of the brook by the bridge. R. was sitting on the fence, his neck and ears carefully turtled under his coat collar, the smoke rising and the rain dripping from the inverted bowl of his pipe. He did not seem to be worrying about his rheumatism. "'What luck?' he asked. "'None at all,' I answered morosely. "'Sorry to keep you waiting.' "'That's all right,' remarked R. "'What do you think I've been doing? "'I've been fishing out of the sawmill window just to kill time. "'There was a patch of floating sawdust down there, "'kind of unlucky place for trout, anyway. "'But I thought I'd put on a worm and let him crawl around a little.' "'He opened his creel as he spoke. "'But I didn't look for a pair of them, he added. "'And there, on top of his smaller fish, "'were as pretty a pair of three-quarter pound brook trout "'as were ever basketed.' "'I'm afraid you got pretty wet,' said R. kindly. "'I don't mind that,' I replied, and I didn't. "'What I minded was the thought of an hour's vain waiting in that roaring stream, "'whipping it with fly after fly, "'while R., the foreordained fisherman, "'was sitting comfortably in a sawmill "'and derricking that pair of three-quarter pounders in through the window. "'I had ventured more warily than he, "'and used, if not, the same skill.' at least the best skill at my command. My conscience was clear, but so was his, and he had had the drier skin and the greater magnanimity, and the biggest fish besides. There is much to be said in a world like ours for taking the world as you find it, and for fishing with a worm. One's memory of such fishing, however agreeable they may be, are not to be identified with a defense of the practice. Yet, after all, the most effective defense of worm fishing is the concrete recollection of some brook that could be fished best or only in that way, or the image of a particular trout that yielded to the temptation of an angleworm after you had flicked fly after fly over him in vain. Indeed, half the zest of brook fishing is in your campaign for individuals, as the Salvation Army workers say, not merely for a basket full of fish qua fish, but for a series of individual trout, which your instinct tells you ought to lurk under that log or be hovering in that ripple. How to get him by some sportsman's like process is the question. If he will rise to some fly in your book, few fishermen will deny that the fly is the more pleasurable weapon. Dainty, luring, beautiful toy, light as thistle down, falling where you will it to fall, holding when the leader tightens and sings like the string of a violin. The artificial fly represents the poetry of angling. Given the gleam of early morning on some wide water, a heavy trout breaking the surface as he curves and plunges, with the fly holding well, with the right sort of rod in your fingers, and the right man in the other end of the canoe, and you perceive how easy is that Emersonian trick of making the pomp of emperors ridiculous. But angling's honest prose, as represented by the lowly worm, has also its exalted moments. The last fish I caught was with a worm, says the honest Walton, and so say I. 
It was the last evening of last August. The dusk was settling deep upon a tiny meadow, scarcely ten rods from end to end. The rank bog grass, already drenched with dew, bent over the narrow, deep little brook so closely that it could not be fished except with a double-shotted, baited hook, dropped delicately between the heads of the long grasses. Underneath this canopy the trout were feeding, taking the hook with a straight downward tug as they made for the hidden bank. It was already twilight when I began, and before I reached the black belt of woods that separated the meadow from the lake, the swift darkness of the north country made it impossible to see the hook. A short half-hour's fishing only, and behold, nearly twenty good trout derricked into a basket until then sadly empty. Your rigorous fly-fisherman would have passed that grass-hidden brook in disdain, but it proved a treasure for the humble. Here, indeed, there was no question of individually-minded fish, but simply a neglected brook, full of trout, which could be reached with the baited hook only. In more open brook fishing, it is always a fascinating problem to decide how to fish a favorite pool or ripple, for much depends upon the hour of the day, the light, the height of water, the precise period of the spring or summer. But after one has decided upon the best theoretical procedure, how often the stupid trout prefers some other plan. And when you have missed a fish that you counted upon landing, what solid satisfaction is still possible for you, if you are philosopher enough to sit down then and there, eat your lunch, smoke a meditative pipe, and devise a new campaign against that particular fish. To get another rise from him after lunch is a triumph of diplomacy. To land him is nothing short of statesmanship, for sometimes he will jump furiously at a fly, for very devilishness, without ever meaning to take it, and then, wearying suddenly of his gymnastics, he will snatch sulkily at a grasshopper, beetle, or worm. Trout feed upon an extraordinary variety of crawling things, as all fishermen know who practice the useful habit of opening the first two or three fish they catch to see what food is that day the favorite. But here, as elsewhere in this world, the best things lie nearest, and there is no bait so killing, week in and week out, as your plain garden or golf green angleworm. Walton's list of possible worms is impressive, and his directions for placing them upon the hook have the placid completeness that belonged to his character. Yet in such matters a little nonconformity may be encouraged. No two men or boys dig bait in quite the same way, though all share, no doubt, the singular elation which guides that grimy occupation with the spirit of romance. The mind is really occupied, not with the wriggling red creatures in the lumps of earth, but with the stout fish which each worm may capture. Just as a saint might rejoice in the squalor of this world as a preparation for the glories of the world to come. Nor do any two experienced fishermen hold quite the same theory as to the best mode of baiting the hook. There are a hundred ways, each of them good. As for the best hook for worm fishing, you will find dicta in every catalogue of fishing tackle, but size and shape and tempering are qualities that should vary with the brook, the season, and the fishermen. Should one use a three-foot leader, or none at all? Whose rods are best for bait fishing? Granted, that all of them should be stiff enough in the tip to lift a good fish by dead strain from a tangle of brush or logs. Such questions, like those pertaining to the boots or coat which one should wear, the style of bait box one should carry, or the brand of tobacco best suited for smoking in the wind, are topics for unending discussion among the serious minded around the campfire. Much edification is in them, and yet they are but prudential maxims after all. They are mere moralities of the Franklin or Chesterfield variety, counsels of worldly wisdom, but they leave the soul untouched. A man may have them at his finger's end, and be no better fisherman at bottom. Or he may, like R, ignore most of the admitted rules, and come home with a full basket. It is a sufficient defense of fishing with a worm to pronounce the truism that no man is a complete angler until he has mastered all the modes of angling. Lovely streams, lonely and enticing, but impossible to fish with a fly, await the fisherman who is not too proud to use with a man's skill 
the same unpretentious tackle which he began with as a boy. But, ah, uh, to fish with a worm, and then not catch your fish! To fail with a fly is no disgrace. Your art may have been impeccable, your patience faultless to the end, but the philosophy of worm fishing is that of results, of having something tangible in your basket when the day's work is done. It is a plea for compromise, for cutting the coat according to the cloth, for taking the world as it actually is. The fly fisherman is a natural foe of compromise. He throws to the trout a certain kind of lure, and they will take it, so, if not, adieu. He knows no middle path. This high man aiming at a million misses an unit. The raptures and the tragedies of consistency are his. He is a scorner of the ground, all honor to him. When he comes back at nightfall and says happily, I have never cast a line more perfectly than I have today, it is almost indecent to peek into his creel. It is like rating Colonel Newcomb by his bank account. But the worm of fisherman is no such proud and isolated soul. He is a low man, rather than a high one. He honestly cares what his friends will think when they look into his basket, to see what he has to show for his day's sport. He watches the foe of compromise men go stumbling forward and superbly falling, while he, with less inflexible courage, manages to keep his feet. He wants to score, and not merely to give a pretty exhibition of base running. At the Harvard-Yale football game of 1903, the Harvard team showed superior strength in rushing the ball. They carried it almost to the Yale goal line repeatedly, but they could not, for some reason, take it over. In the instant of absolute need, the Yale line held, and when the Yale team had to score in order to win, they scored. As the crowd streamed out of the stadium, a veteran Harvard alumnus said, This news will cause great sorrow in one home I know of, until they learn by tomorrow's paper that the Harvard team acquitted itself creditably. Exactly. Given one team bent upon acquitting itself creditably, and another team determined to win, which will be victorious? The stay-at-homes on the Yale campus that day were not curious to know whether their team was acquitting itself creditably, but whether it was winning the game. Every other question than that was to those young Philistines merely a fine-spun irrelevance. They took the cash and let the credit go. There is much to be said, no doubt, for the Harvard veteran's point of view. The proper kind of credit may be a better asset for eleven boys than any championship and to fish a bit of water consistently and skillfully with your best flies and in your best manner is perhaps achievement enough. So says the foe of compromise, at least. But the Yale spirit will be prying into the basket in search of fish. It prefers concrete results. If all men are by nature either Platonists or Aristotelians, fly fishermen or worm fishermen, how difficult it is for us to do one another justice. Differing in mind, in aim, and method, how shall we say infallibly that this man or that is wrong? To fail with Plato for companion may be better to succeed with Aristotle. But one thing is perfectly clear. There is no warrant for compromise, but in success. Use a worm if you will, but you must have fish to show for it if you would escape the finger of scorn. If you find yourself camping by an unknown brook, and are deputed to catch the necessary trout for breakfast, it is wiser to choose the surest bait. The crackle of the fish in the frying pan will atone for any theoretical defect in your method, but to choose the surest bait, and then to bring back no fish, is unforgivable. Forsake Plato if you must, but you may do so only at the price of justifying yourself in the terms of Aristotelian arithmetic. The college president who abandoned his college in order to run a cotton mill was free to make his own choice of a calling, but he was never pardoned for bankrupting the mill. If one is bound to be a low man rather than an impractical idealist, he should at least make sure of his vulgar success. Is all this but a disguised defense of pot-hunting? No, there is no possible defense of pot-hunting, whether it be upon a trout brook or in the stock market. Against fish or men, one should play the game fairly. 
Yet, for that matter, some of the most skillful fly fishermen I have known were pot hunters at heart, and some of the most prosaic looking merchants were idealists, compared to whom Shelley was but a dreaming boy. All depends upon the spirit with which one makes his venture. I recall a boy of five who gravely watched his father tramp off after rabbits, gun on shoulder and beagle in leash. Thereupon he shouldered a wooden sword, and dragging his reluctant black kitten by a string, sallied forth upon the dusty Vermont road to get a lion for breakfast. That is the true sporting temper. Let there be but a fine idealism in the quest, and the particular object is unessential. A true fisherman's happiness, says Mr. Cleveland, is not dependent upon his luck. It depends upon his heart. No doubt all amateur fishing is but play, as the psychologists soberly term it. Not a necessary, but a freely assumed activity, born of surplusage of vitality. Nobody, not even a carpenter wearied of his job, has to go fishing unless he wants to. He may indeed find himself breakfastless in camp, and obliged to betake himself to the brook, but then he need not have gone into the woods at all. Yet, if he does decide to fish, let him. Venture as warily, use the same skill, do his best. Whatever variety of tackle he may choose, he can be a whole-souled sportsman with the poorest equipment, or a mean trout hog with the most elaborate. Only in the name of gentle Isaac himself, let him be a complete angler, and let the man be a passionate amateur of all the arts of life, despising none of them, and using all of them for his soul's good, and for the joy of his fellows. If he be, so to speak, but a worm fisherman, a follower of humble occupations and pledged to unromantic duties, let him still thrill with the pleasures of the true fisherman. To make the most of dull hours, to make the best of dull people, to like a poor jest better than none, to wear the threadbare coat like a gentleman, to be outvoted with a smile, to hitch your wagon to the old horse if no star is handy. This is the wholesome philosophy taught by fishing with a worm. The fun of it depends upon the heart. There may be as much zest in saving as in spending, in working for small wages as for great, in avoiding the snapshots of publicity as in being invariably first among those present. But a man should be honest. If he catches most of his fish with a worm, secures the larger portion of his success by commonplace industry, let him glory in it. For this, too, is part of the great game. Yet he ought not, in that case, to pose as a fly fisherman only, to carry himself as one aware of the immortalizing camera, to pretend that life is easy, if one but knows how to drop a fly into the right ripple. For life is not easy, after all is said. It is a long brook to fish, and it needs a stout heart and a wise patience. All the flies there are in the book and all the bait that can be carried in the box are likely to be needed ere the day is over. But like the psalmist's river of God, this brook is full of water, and there is plenty of good fishing to be had in it if one is neither afraid nor ashamed of fishing sometimes with a worm. End of Fishing with a Worm by Bliss Perry <laughs>